Hello and welcome to the Women Leading Show, the fireside. I'm getting a bit hot here, but the fireside uh, festive chat. We've all donned our little hats, tinsel, um, as a very special kind of offering for our last show of the year, the Women Leading Show, which has come about as the, as our, uh, the outcome of our fantastic book, The Women Leading Book. And uh, we wanted to finish off the year with a special roundup of all the women who have um, been amazing in the year 2020, which has been an incredible year. But before we come on to that, let's start with who we've got here. So fantastic to have our guest author. Um, we're all authors, obviously, of the Women Leading Book. But our, our extra special guest author this time is Frances from 5050. Hi, Frances Scott. Hi, Joe. Lovely to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Oh, no, pleasure, pleasure. And it's great. It's, it's kind of, um, it fits in nicely because you were virtually the last chapter in the book. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, obviously it, it, and it fit, fits in the, the lovely kind of remit of how the book is run. We also have our other authors and uh, my co-hosts, Kim Adele Platts and Joe Sumner. Hi, guys. Hi. 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 Yeah, lovely to see you. And also about our other author who has popped in before. So if you'd like to see Richard's specific show, you can do. But Richard Bellas, welcome again. Hi, Joe. Always good to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's always nice, obviously, because the Women Leading show, the movement, the book is a balanced uh, conversation. Uh, so it's not just women, it's, it's men. And uh, Richard has played an incredible part in helping us on our journey talking about equality and what is needed. So later on, we're gonna come on to the women of 2020 and uh, everyone here is gonna talk about the, their woman. Um, most of us have got a long list, but I've told them I've been really strict with them been because I've got my naughty elf hat on, you see. So I'm gonna be really naughty today and tell you no, one only. So one only um, woman of 2020. But before we do that, let's come on to um, the chapter that Francis kindly donated to put in this book. Um, Francis is the founder of 5050. She set this uh, organization up seven years ago. Um, and I'd like to say only seven years ago and from your kitchen table, I think all the best ideas come from a kitchen table or a glass of wine, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> but she'd started 5050 Parliament and the results, it particularly I feel in the last general election were astounding. I'm a, a I'm a director for 5050 because once I really heard what Francis was doing, I wanted to help because it's an incredible cause. So Francis, welcome to the Women Leading Show. Tell us about 5050 and all that you've achieved. Well, 5050 um, Parliament has a very clear aspiration. Uh, what we want is for women to have equal seats and equal say at Westminster, but not only um, in Westminster, but actually, you know, in all elected bodies throughout the country. Um, and as you say, it started, uh, I was just really angry when I first discovered that um, seven years ago, only 23% of our MPs uh, were women. And I think it, that women's experience uh, and um, opinions count just as much as men's, especially when it comes to uh, running society, and that Parliament should really draw upon the widest possible pool of talent, including the 32 million uh, UK women. But our democracy was never designed uh, around women. And um, although women gained the vote, you know, over 100 years ago now, uh, they still have not got equal seats and equal say. So uh, something has to be done. Um, so uh, things have evolved since I first set up a petition about this. Um, and, and now what we run is the Ask Her to Stand and Sign Up to Stand program. And we inspire and encourage and support women uh, in coming to our website and clicking Sign Up to Stand. And the women that click Sign Up to Stand with us, we're a cross party organization because this is about building a better democracy. It's not really uh, a political issue. So the women that click Sign Up to Stand with us we then send them a sort of personal political profile, which is an interactive sort of checklist of the steps that you need to take. We allocate them a 50-50 buddy, so it's kind of peer support, a friendly person, a friendly face in politics. We invite them to weekly bite-sized meetings with our Asker to Stand directors, and you're one of them, thank you, Joe, uh, where they learn sort of, they get 
um, detailed advice uh, uh, from experts within each particular party. And for women from minority groups, we offer sort of bespoke uh, support should they require it. Um, because there are obviously some women face multiple hurdles and double discrimination. So um, we want to offer them additional support. And we, you know, the results have been transformational really. In 2019 election, I, you know, just about a year ago, we inspired over 50 women who were standing were actually part of our campaign. And nine went on to win seats at Westminster. There were only 12 extra women elected. Um, so it's now, uh, there are now 220 women at Westminster. But, um, and at that rate, it's gonna take till 2060 <laughs> to get gender balance. So, you know, our job is, 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 is really important. And it's wonderful, as you said, really, Joe, over the recent months, we had a massive Ask Her to Stand Day um, on the 21st of November. Over 300 women clicked on our website to sign up to stand. And we're now calling them and helping them. And, and they just love the bite-sized meetings. These are kind of of cozy sort of group chats where they can support each other and you know some uh, the buddy is someone you can call to uh, ask for advice and help so um it's really making a difference and we're super excited about it well it's amazing i mean well done you yeah right that's just incredible achievement because you could almost argue potentially that three quarters of the women in parliament are there in part thanks to 50 50 parliament which is incredible because it is such a long process and you have really made such a difference to so many women. Um, and I, I just think it's amazing, Francis. Joe, 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 no, I, I, we need to, uh, I just need to be clear about that. No, not three quarters of the women in parliament are there because of us. Um, okay. <laughs> there are 220 women in parliament. And no, 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 the newly elected, sorry. You mean the newly increase, elected. don't okay. you? Um, yeah. We're only yeah. 12 extra yeah. women elected. Yeah, and, and in nine fact, six, well, nine, nine women who won seats were part of 50-50, but only six were extra women. I, I mean, I'm a bit of a statistician, which is why I <laughs> like 50-50, but only six were, um, six of the extra women were part of 50-50. So we accounted for half the extra women, um, which is great i mean that is a as you say an impact and what we need in the next election is we need 60 extra women to win seats so um what our campaign is doing now you know we need to uh, increase that you know a, a fivefold so what our campaign is doing now is is really trying to inspire a pipeline of women and then we signpost them to the right support within each political party and we're working really closely with all the parties of course some have done a whole load better than others let's face it you know um labor is already 50 50 51 percent of labor mps are women but they've still got quite a lot of work to do in local government and it doesn't mean to say that the sexism is has been um, you know annihilated within Labour, but actually it's the Conservative Party that needs to do a lot more work. Only 24% of their MPs are women, so they need to double the number of women. Um, still there was an increase uh in the last election but so we were and of course you know um the lib dems you know seven out of uh, 11 of their mps are women so definitely on the opposition benches um this job is almost done um but uh, on on the government benches there's a huge amount of work to do um but fortunately all the parties are behind us in this they're all wanting to build a better democracy because the bottom line is parliament is meant to be representative you know corporations are not called upon to be representative but parliament is a democratic institution so it it should be representative broadly one would expect it to be if you know statistically if it was equally accessible to everybody but it clearly isn't um, so this is a historic problem i mean democracy has been around for two thousand years uh, but women have only had the vote for just over a hundred so uh, we you know we all need to work at this because um the evidence is that uh, if you have a more diverse group of people making decisions, you you know you get better decision making. So ultimately this is about building a better parliament. 
often people say to me, well, I want the best. Well, definitely, of course, at 50-50, you know, aiming for 50-50 is not saying that we don't want the best. Of course, we want to level up. Um, and that means we want to draw upon the widest possible pool of talent, um, including the 32 million women. Yeah. Well, and the, the thing that really re is so relevant to this is it has to start from governance. And I've, you know, it's something I say quite often is that, you know, you make that so clear in the book. You know, you, you, you say it has to start from government because women have to be at the table, not the meal. I love that phrase. It, I, I didn't come up with that. But women have been the meal on the table, they haven't been sat at that table. And I think it's incredible. It's so powerful that you are you're steering this. And obviously, there are other groups that offer support because 5050 is very much a supportive network. It's an opportunity to air your worries, concerns, the bite sized meetings. I know from my, my own ones that, you know, very much women are very open and honest with what really concerns them about running. And I think that that has such value because, with the best will in the world, um, that so many women. Uh, really want to be in an, an, an able environment to talk about their own personal fears and we it wouldn't necessarily do that at your average Lib Dem meeting or your average Labour meeting so 5050 really fills that gap what would you say is as the main um, benefit that women you do quite a lot of research I know Francis and you like your stats um, what do you think <laughs> is the main benefit from um that 5050 creates so that the real value for the candidates yeah no i would like to reflect that back at you joe it's 5050 is a friendly place you know politics can feel very combative and that's because of the way it's been designed but mm. actually 5050 is a friendly space where uh, people, because it's not just women, but um, uh, can support each other and point each other in the right direction. And, and as you say, there's no such thing as a stupid question at a 50-50 bite-sized meeting. You're not, you know, we are not looking to, uh, we, we pass no judgment. We're not trying to select the candidates. All we're trying to do is we're sort of a recruitment arm, is we're putting them forward. So as you rightly say, in a political meeting, women might be concerned about putting their foot in it or something, you know, and looking an idiot or, uh, because they're less um, less well informed or, or less knowledgeable about the political process but you know we, we, we're not part of that so um, women are, are, are it's a friendly place that's I think the most important thing and I just want to go uh, talk a little bit more about this aspect of representation because the other riposte I often get is well men can represent women and of course men can represent women and women are very good at representing men. I mean, women are very good listeners and they're very good at sort of then, you know, sort of conveying people's concerns. But the evidence suggests that men are much better at listening to women's concerns when there are more women in the room. When women are outnumbered 80 to 20, um, it can be quite difficult uh, to, to have their opinions and their life experience uh, uh, really uh, to be sort of amplified. Um, so that's why you need a balance. Um, and, you know, from the men's point of view, I mean, let's take tax on tampons. There are aspects of life that men do not know anything about right. and, right. and are hugely relevant to half the population. And that's why we need women to have equal seat at the table, as you rightly say. In the past, women have always played a supportive role, supporting men into public life. And what we now need is men supporting women into public life and everybody to be supporting women. So um, that's the sort of structure that we're creating here. It's a kind of 50-50 friendly network of supportive people saying, women, you're welcome at Westminster. Please sign up to stand because we need your experience and expertise. Yeah, brilliant. And obviously, that's something that really is endorsed with the message of 5050. Wendy Chamberlain has, has recently been, she was, she's been in a year now, goodness me, um, an MP, ex-police officer, mum of two, um, non-political background at all, almost stumbled into politics, which is a common thing for women, I think. I don't, I don't think the, most women don't set out to be a politician as their ambition. <laughs> In fact, on the contrary, I'd say they probably wouldn't want to be. Um, but people, women like w Wendy are fantastic role models, I think, because, you know, they just prove that you don't necessarily have to have a, a law degree, a political degree, 
Um, obviously, she has been involved in law, but any experience is good experience. And um, when it comes from, especially with families and communities, which women on average know more about because they're the ones on average that mostly stay at home with their kids and know about the local community slightly more. Obviously, that's hopefully changing right now because more men are at home working from home too. Um, so I just want to throw it open to Kim, Richard and Joe because obviously the, you, know, you have met Francis along the way with our meetings with women leading. Do any of you have a question that you'd like to uh, throw in? Just before we do that, can I uh, just introduce, we've got one of our other guests who's in the green room patiently waiting to join us, oh, um, which really? is Sarah Sabin. So uh, forgive me for just directing us slightly, but um, I thought I would do that before I just pop poor Sarah into the room. Fantastic. Hey, welcome, Hello. Sarah. Hello. Sorry, I was about a minute late. Um, oh. I've, been, I've been listening to you talk, Francis. So. Oh, thank brilliant. you. Thank, thanks for coming back. So Sarah was in our, oh my gosh, I, I can't even remember now, show back way back when, a while ago now. It feels like years ago, doesn't it? With <laughs> the way this I think year it was gone. in July. It must be, it must be July. So thank you for, so, uh, for coming back. Obviously, at the moment, we're talking about um, Francis Scott. Francis meets Sarah, Sarah meets Francis. Um, and uh, yeah, and if, if any of you've got any questions for Francis, Francis and I talk all the time. So I've always got gazillions of things I could, I love to chat to Francis about um, and being involved with 50-50. But what, what, is there anything you'd like to ask Francis um, about what she does and about the message? Yeah, I, I would like to ask something, um, which is, Francis, what is the most significant barrier to more women standing? Um, yeah, that's such a frequent question. And on the whole, I don't like to focus on the barriers. I like to focus on the solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just a historic thing. Uh, democracy has not been designed to ensure that women can participate. In fact, to be involved in politics, very often you need quite deep pockets. So women lack time. Uh, they lack money. Women very often take, you know, are, are mm, play the lead parenting role, if we want to put it like that. So in fact, Parliament is like a great big game of musical chairs and the seats get filled and the people stay there indefinitely. And um, so, you know, if, if you're, it, 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 it can be quite tricky, I think, for women to participate in that when, when there's very little um, opportunities to, uh, to, to occupy a seat because they've, they've been there, you know, the person has occupied it uh, indefinitely. And it's quite sad because actually um, being an MP makes a great second career. And um, I think it's it would be very useful uh, to be able to involve um, many sort of older women at Westminster who, as you rightly say, Joe, have perhaps become empty nesters. They've got a wide range of experience of both parenting and juggling family life with a professional career. Um, but the seats are filled. And um, so that, there are, frankly, there are so many reasons that on the whole, I, I, I don't like to spend an awful lot of time talking about the problems. Let's focus on the solutions. And that is about inspiring women, encouraging them to stand, uh, overcoming the imposter syndrome, you know, breaking down the barriers, uh, helping perhaps raise the money, talking about childcare, looking for supportive partners who are prepared to say, yes, you can do it. Um, and um, it's also about making sure that these women are realistic uh, about, you know, the potential and looking for the key seats, you know, mm -hmm. which is the next seat available and becoming political about it. So um, that's that, that's what I like to do is focus on the solutions. Yeah, that's, I think that was an excellent answer, actually, and a, and a very useful strategic choice. Um, but it begs the question, what can we do to increase the turnover then so that you don't get people occupying a seat for so long and blocking the introduction of new people. So what can you do about that specific well, thing? In, yeah, uh, good point. You know, incumbency is an interesting situation in our democracy and it's viewed as impolite to run against an incumbent. Mm. Um, but um, I'm, you know, I, 
I don't know. I'm not really here to offer the, uh, the solutions. Parliament has mm. to come up with the decision about that. Um, I, I, we just need to point to the fact that something needs to be done. The Electoral Reform Society has discussed incumbency for many years. Um, incumbency also is a disadvantage for young men, anyone who's wanting to participate. Um, maybe we should have set terms. Um, you know, the US president can only run for two terms. Uh, but then, you know, the disadvantage of that is that you might um, reduce the level of experience and political experience, you know, at Westminster. And of course, the difficulty you face with incumbency is the people that have been there for a long time enjoy the job. And they're the very, you know, they're not the people that are actually going to be calling for a solution to incumbency. Um, mm. I, you know, this is, um, this is a, a tricky, a real tricky issue. Uh, and um, I'm not sure quite what the solution might be. I mean, maybe MPs should have to reapply every time um, and uh, face selection committees. And maybe there should always be 50-50 platform um, so that, uh, mm. so that uh, the selection committees see all the new talent that's available um, and, and can then weigh up the choice about whether you go with the experienced MP that you know and love or whether actually it's time to look for um, some new talent. Uh, I mean, you know, that might be one solution. Well, certainly in the last election, one of the issues in the area I was living at the time was it was a choice between a younger and first time um, male candidate and somebody really, really experienced. Um, and actually, I was really encouraged to see that uh, the younger person, the younger candidate was selected in, in that one. But I, I can certainly see your point. And there's a real value in being an organization that's that shines a spotlight on what's going on and and I respect what you're saying in the sense that you you can't necessarily also be the ones to find all the solutions it's a much you know we co-own that problem after all as a society don't we yeah absolutely it's our democracy it's our parliament um uh, we, it's just really important that we all think carefully about these issues and the people that are representing us and, um, yeah, the kind of democracy that we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And I actually just want to amplify the point that Joe made earlier. Um, again, there's quite a lot of evidence that men, uh, some men sort of, you know, when they're born or as little boys, they think, oh, yes, I'm going to be the next president of the United States. Um, and on the whole, again, this is not something that little girls um, aspire to and who knows what the reason for that is I expect there are many different sociological reasons um, so we have found that women need to be asked three times before they will consider standing uh, there's plenty of evidence to support that which is why we run the ask her to stand campaign and we encourage people to look for talented women or women that you think would make great representatives and ask them once and twice and three times you have to ask women again and again which um seems a bit of a shame and of course some might argue therefore well they're not the right person for the job but that actually isn't true it's just because our system is um is not designed and uh, uh, to accommodate women easily and therefore women perhaps face uh, as i say imposter syndrome and some reluctance to get involved but the wonderful thing is that the women who do get involved find that it's an inspirational wonderful career i mean many of the female mps at westminster really enjoy Enjoy their job and they're very good at it um, so you know we really need to encourage women uh, wholeheartedly to get involved um, at the highest level in our democracy yeah and this, I think Richard wanted to pop in with something as well uh, well I can do um, Francis I adore your dynamism and your energy it's off the scale it's extraordinary <laughs> um, we're talking about public service and the vast majority of women are naturally adept at sustaining and nurturing others. And some of the ones that I know struggle to then include themselves in that. And I'm thinking of you and your energy. So, you know, what do you do for yourself? But what's your advice and what's your advice to, to women who say, 
well, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll sustain and nurture myself in a minute when I've, when I've looked after everyone else first. Mm-hmm. Because you're going to need enormous that- energy. You need energy to, to do the kinds of things that you're doing, okay? And I think that, that maybe, I don't know if it's cultural, I don't know if it's behavioural, women tend, that I know, tend not to say, I'll go first, you know, but I'll do it after everyone else is okay. Oh, Richard, that is so touching. Um, and actually, Helen Pankhurst phoned me the other day and said, Francis, are you okay? I mean, I, I was so touched by that. And Sam Smethers at Fawcett, you know, I'm very fortunate. I am actually surrounded by really, um, really caring people and people like you and many of my team. I've got a fantastic team of people. I can, it's really interesting. I mean, I find campaigning for 50-50 just, it's, it's so exciting. I meet such fantastic people um, that it actually energizes me. You know, I mean, just being here with you today is wonderful. It's, I'm, I'm so honored that you're prepared to listen to what I have to say and uh, that you sympathize and empathize with the cause. Um, I'm very fortunate. I have four beautiful, wonderful children and I, I love my family and I've got a great I've got a lovely dog and, um, you know, I go walking every day. I enjoy playing tennis. Um, I used to be an antenatal teacher, so I used to help women prepare for birth and parenting along with their partners. Empowering women is just what I live for and it's what I've lived for for many years now. So it's just part of my DNA. Um, I, I, In fact, I would be I would be in a more sorry state if I didn't just follow this aspiration. My husband said to me when I did start this um, seven years ago, uh, he said, why are you doing this? Please don't do this. There are other people that can do this. And I said, you know what, if I don't do this, I will just burst. I I just had to. And um, I think it's really wonderful for people when they find a passion like that. Um, And uh, therefore, it comes very easily to me, is is my answer to you, Richard. Um, I I would be in more trouble if I didn't do it. So what I'm hearing is there's there's passion. So there's um, there's purpose. And actually, there's inclusion, self-inclusion. Do you see what I mean? That's I think that's the point I'm getting to, is that this inclusion starts with self it's you know how am i you can't pour from an empty cup it's like how am i going to nurture myself so and then this is what for me is exciting about women as leaders mm. because then naturally the, the, the giving to others is already naturally in place so if i so if, if women can top up themselves then there's this natural flow and abundance that goes out to everyone else and i bet you you've got some research that backs that up <laughs> well i don't know do they call it Mas- maslow's hierarchy of needs i mean you know i'm in a very fortunate position you, you've got you know you your, your sort of food your home or all sorts of things that boxes have been ticked for me and i was i was very happily married for 25 years sadly my husband died three years ago and that to be honest richard was, was an extremely difficult part of my life um but you know if you've got all your relatively basic needs fulfilled then um you reach a point where you can actually start to sort of it's a bit like a volcano you can start to give to people and um i am in a very fortunate position in that respect so um i can i i i i, I enjoy it is and and therefore it, i get i get a lot from this so it's not selfless and i i i have the most i have to say i have the most amazing team and joe is part of that and the exciting thing is the team is building you know we've got incredible people joining us all the time so i couldn't possibly do this by myself um it isn't it isn't just my responsibility it's it's this, this, so that's see, exciting. this is the other exciting bit because i think this is what women naturally do they naturally model co-leadership or what i'm fascinated about is co-leadership rather than that hierarchical leadership and mm. so this is where women again are naturally modeling what's possible to to for us all to be more um whole in ourselves when we're leading rather than the, the old model, black and white, work is this, family is this, friends are over there. It's naturally being, you know, we're whole people. We have a way of living, we have a lifestyle. It includes what we're passionate about. It includes our service to our society. And and we need this collectively, men and women. So, and the women yeah. as well. 
And I just think I'd, I'd like to come on to ask Sarah in a minute because Sarah's a leadership um, and coach for mostly entrepreneurs, but she's uh, leadership is very much her bag. But I think also the, there is within 50-50, but also within politics with more women coming on board, we're losing that division of politics. Um, and it's a very much a, an accumulative purposeful um, path that, that they're on collectively. So all the female MPs I've spoken to, and it's been many over the, the time that I've been involved in 50-50, they all are in WhatsApp groups, they, they support each other, but not just in party. And, and I think one thing that we, we need, really need to change and focus on, and this, has, this time has given us it, is the collective purpose because politics shouldn't be so divisive it shouldn't be them and us it should be it should be uh for starts for starters respectful and mm -hmm. politics has been so disgustingly horrid and aggressive for so long and i think that i i personally have find francis and i know i've shared this with you that a lot of the women that i mentor they say the aggression in politics is also what puts them off amongst other things um, and it feels like that is changing, which is which is incredibly exciting and and really hopeful for where we're going. But I know that a lot of women are slightly changed that in their own way in politics generally. Um, and obviously, like you say, at 50-50, we all work together to attract women. I wouldn't speak to someone who is a different party and put them off, obviously. It's a collective cause, and, and that's what we should all be um, doing right now, Sarah. What would you like? Would you like to chip in with uh, with some thoughts on leadership right now? Because um, I know you've got lots to say on that subject. Hi, Joe and um, Francis. Thank you so much. It's so nice, <laughs> so much, so nice to listen to you. As Richard said, so much energy there. Thank you. Um, so, how to boil this down in this context? So. Carrying on from the theme about collectivism and co-leadership, I would like to think that we are all moving naturally towards that direction because leadership is about other people. If you're, <laughs> if you're not working collaboratively and collectively, if you're not thinking about the collective win, then I would argue it's, it's not really leading people at all. And unfortunately, what tends to happen is when people get promoted in, say, a corporate environment, they're promoted purely on technical skills. So if you're really good at sales, you get to you get to be promoted. But then what tends to lag is the emotional intelligence. So they're not so good at bringing up the level of the team in general. And that's a real shame because collectively you can achieve so much more than you can with just one person being brilliant at something and everyone else being average. Yeah, no, that's that's really, really the way forward, isn't it? That's what needs to happen. Um, um, absolutely. I mean, you know, and again, our, it comes back to design. Um, architecturally, for example, a donut design apparently leads to more collaboration and I gathered G C C H Q. no uh, where is it the Cheltenham place um, okay. anyway it's, it's designed like a donut whereas of, of course our house the house of parliament was designed in the Victorian times and I gather that you know the space between um, the two uh, uh, party benches is a sort of a, a sword something to do with sword fighting anyway oh. and um, I, 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 I get you know this this is so old-fashioned and um completely unhelpful we've got major problems to solve i mean coronavirus is 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 obviously has highlighted a global global pandemic there are going to be more pandemics given the nature of the way we we live now yeah. but climate change is actually the biggest problem that we face um as a collective collectively and to solve this problem requires massive collaboration and um i think i, I do think that women's uh, leadership styles are more collaborative and it has been fantastic working in a, i call it working across the political spectrum whereas a lot of people talk uh, who are political talk about the political divide i really don't like that terminology this isn't a t divide this is a spectrum and in fact even on one side of the house you might have very similar opinions to others working on the other side of the house sometimes people have difficulty women in particular uh, about which party to join 
But at the end of the day, you just have to decide in a kind of nuanced way where probably where your where your pro, where your sort of values lie most, uh, and then understand that if you're working within um, a particular party, you can change policy. It's much easier to work to change stuff if you're involved. And um, so it, it, all the way along, we say, look, pick a party. I know it can be quite difficult, but just pick a party and then work within that organization to try and help them move towards um, a, a vision that you might have. And it is all about compromise. Um, uh, so, and I, I, I guess I do think that women are good at compromise. They're good at collaborating. And, um, and this is the kind of thing they can bring uh, to, to a, a, an institution. Uh, like uh, the House of Commons. Yeah, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Francis. It's been fantastic talking to you. And obviously, just uh, oh, last you. quick plug for the book. So, Francis' chapter is in here, as is um, yes. myself. Kim and I was Joe. so honoured to be involved. Thank you. I, I can't. It's not showing up, is it? But thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Yeah, no, it, it just felt like it would it wouldn't be uh, the book that I wanted it to be if you weren't in it. So uh, I'm really glad you are. And uh, Sarah will be an author in our next book, Women Leading Two, which uh, if you're interested in, please get in touch. Very thrilled to have you, Sarah. So let's come on to the, the final part of the show. And uh, I'm really excited to hear from you all today. Um, you're Woman of 2020. And uh, I know quite a few of you have sent me your lists and been quite long and but actually talk about your list but let's let's focus on the person that for you stands out for this year the one person and why so Kim we haven't heard from you much would you mind going first and sharing with us who your woman of 2020 is and why um it's a really tricky one and I know I sent you a list and actually um I'm not going to pick one I'm going to pick a lot of women in general because it's been the trait the traits that they've demonstrated that I think if you cut across whether that's uh, Jacinda Hearn or whether or not it's um, the lady who runs my nursery it's the way that they have stepped up to really listen and to listen to understand not to interject to be there for people and, and Richard you made it brought it up beautifully which is very often women um, are very good at nurturing others and, and very bad at nurturing themselves. And I think we're also often quite bad at sharing how much we appreciate each other. And over the over the last year, particularly with COVID, um, I think people have come into their own, both men and women. But for me, the piece that stood out for me about the women that have really made a difference was they've stepped into their empathy um, they've stepped into their communication style and they've come into their own on being able to provide that safe space for people, particularly in a leadership uh, arena where people right now are, are dealing with having to work remotely or non-remotely and feeling disengaged. And I think that ability to reach out and provide a safe space has been the game changer. Um, and I think we can all learn from that, irrelevant of whether we're men or women. stunned everybody into silence oh. no we've lost Joe. Oh, no. she was she was talking oh. and then she's disappeared just, um, here I'm, she is I'm contemplating too many things at the same time one that the fire is going out and i need to need to sort it out and and two i was just thinking god that's such a relevant point that um you know we, we are it's been such a, a challenging year and um it's been more important than ever to open up and share and be compassionate so uh thank you kim um let's come on to uh Joe Sumner next, and um, then we'll come on to Rich, Sarah, and then Francis. Just while I poke the fire, by the way, <laughs> just, uh, I'll, I'll um, meet myself. <laughs> yeah, you go for it. Um, I think I took a very similar approach, actually, to Kim with that question, which is, number one, it's two women that I want to name, and I'm going to name them, but they're women uh, perhaps more in my life or my circle than necessarily in the public domain. Um, so that's my wonderful, wonderful friend, um, Elizabeth Cairns, who is a climate activist who is working so hard to bring a stop to uh, the HS2 project. 
And the other is a fantastic coach and leader called Joanna Martin of One of Many, which is a brilliant organization supporting women around the world to come into leadership positions. And the thing that they have in common um, is facing really uh, powerful and politically divisive and painful situations with an open heart. So speaking their truth incredibly uh, articulately and with absolutely no hedging of what they mean, but doing it in such a way that they remain open hearted to people who have a great range of opinion. And I've been really impressed. Joanna Martin in particular runs quite a large community on Facebook called the B1 Global Community. And during the height of the Black Lives Matter, um, I almost want to say explosion of activity and focus. Um, she held that space so exquisitely beautifully. She set down the rules for the group. She invited debate and openness and she let things run while keeping an eye for when somebody needed to step in and reset the boundary. And I mean, it was exquisite how she did it. It really, really was such brilliant leadership. And with Elizabeth, what I see is this passionate commitment to her cause. She's giving up so much of her own time um, to be on the front line supporting the campaign. I mean, multiple days of every single week when she's the main earner for her family. And she engages in debate with such uh, a combination of passion and politeness. You know, it was interesting that politeness came up, that she includes all different um, opinions while remaining absolutely on target with her own and why she feels that um, so strongly and what the impact of not taking climate change seriously is. Um, so for, for me, they've inspired me with the way in which they've held those boundaries and um, spoken their truth with compassion uh, for others. So th they are my joint women of the year. Brilliant. And hopefully we'll have uh, Elizabeth on the show next year because she was meant to come on this year, wasn't she? But I'm looking forward to meeting her. Um, let's go to Sarah next. Sarah, who would be your woman of the year? So I actually started thinking about this only this morning and I was racking my brains. And I remembered um, one of the leadership groups that I'm a part of on LinkedIn there was an excerpt or quote from a lady called Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who is basically, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not hugely into politics, I'll preface what I'm saying with that, but something about that post kind of really made me want to find out more about her. And it's just, I mean, what I read was amazing, so, you know, youngest ever woman ever to serve in US Congress from a working class Puerto Rican family. Um, she actually, you know, kind of says as well, well, I thought that politics was for people that had wealth, social influence and power. Hmm. And it was only when she, so she ended up going to this uh, Indian reservation in Dakota where she actually started seeing it differently. And she started seeing politics as being about protecting the community. And that that kind of inspired her to go into politics. And then there was one specific example of this year of when she was accosted um, by, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but a politician on Capitol Hill who basically called her an effing B. Um, and she went on to TV to speak out against um, violence towards women, aggressive behavior, and the kind of systemic sexism that exists in US politics. So she really kind of came up as top of mind for me when I was thinking about it this morning. Yeah, I remember her post, actually, it was it was very powerful. And it really caused uh, repercussions, which which is what we need, isn't it? Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing. Richard, let's come on to you next and then we'll okay, get to Francis. Thanks. 
Um, incidentally, Joanna Martin trained me, uh, was one of my NLP trainers um, more than a decade ago. Fabulous lady. Uh, well, um, I am going to say this: that uh, someone has, has, someone extraordinary, has walked into my life uh, the second half of this year. And so I'm mentioning her because she inspires me to want to be a better man. You know, she and she want I want to be a man that people can trust. And I think that's where a lot of the men's work is required. Um, and women inspire me to be that. And, and this 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 woman in particular, she's fabulous, and I'm so grateful to have met her. Um, I got to mention. I'm going to mention my mum, and I'm going to mention my sister. Um, uh, and they are gradually including themselves in their lives, which is great. Their their needs, I mean. Um, so, but to pick out somebody, there's an extraordinary uh, woman called Dashita Gillies, and she was. Um, and if you her story is, you know, if you know sort of Slumdog Millionaire, then you know she was brought up in a Mumbai slum. Um, she now lives in London. She's married. She has a gorgeous family. And she is determined. I mean, she set up uh, Munch. It's called M A N C H. That is a platform for interconnecting philanthropists, impact investors, and corporates um, to really be able to deliver and measure um, impact per investment in line with the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals. So it's extraordinary what she's doing. What I love, though, is whenever she's interviewed about what she does. There's still this sort of culture from the media that forces her to say she's self-made, she got here by herself, you know, mm. she's like, she's this, it's still the sort of the heroic story that they're trying to pull out of her because that, and it's so old and she recognises this and she says, no, I wouldn't be with that. I wouldn't be here by myself if it wasn't for everyone else. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my devoted husband and my extraordinary daughter and our dog, you know, and our friends. So she she stands in this space of yes here i am and here is everyone else and i love that um another friend i'm going to mention one more i know i'm cheating um solitaire townsend is the is the um the founder of futera which is a creative sustainability agency and something she did this year she put out a list of these are all the women you need to know in sustainability you know, she, she doesn't go, look at me, look at me. Or if you are looking at me, look at all these other people. So it's that. It's it's the inclusivity that these extraordinary women bring. Thank mm -hmm. you for letting me cheat. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. And um, Francis. Oh, Francis, we get I'm the so sorry. It's the daughter trying to get hold of me. <laughs> um, how embarrassing. No, don't worry. <laughs> it happens. We're live. These things happen. Okay, um, I'll get back to her as soon as we're over. The person I'd like to mention is Sarah Gilbert, uh, the scientist who's working at Oxford University to develop a vaccine uh, against COVID. And um, I think it, it just demonstrates, you know, women are good at stuff. <laughs> and she's leading this. And um, uh, uh, she 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 apparently emails people at four o'clock in the morning because when you've got a passion about something, you know, she lies awake. She doesn't lie awake at night, but she might. I, I find myself doing this often. You wake up and you suddenly think, oh, my word, that's a good idea. And you want to deal with it immediately. So um, I was listening to her on the radio this morning. Uh, I've heard her before. I think she's inspirational. She had some tough choices to make in January this year about which direction to take. And she she's a mother of triplets. And I think that probably means she's got a lot of staying power and a wealth of experience. And um, she said one of the advantages of being a mother of triplets is that she has learned how to function without a lot of sleep. And um, so uh, I uh, she's the person I, I would like to to um, put forward. Yeah, brilliant. She is oh, someone's sound just gone. Um, Hopefully that's not me. Uh, yeah, no, she is remarkable. She really is. Um, I read an interview of her recently, and she is so. She just I'm just doing my job, just doing my job, you know. And and to do so much with such that is is so transformatory. To just to see it as her job. There's no ego there, is there? It's just that she's on a. This is 
just what she does and uh, she's a remarkable woman. Fantastic, thank you. Well, I'd, I'd like just to finish off with, for me, there are so many. Kamala Harris, for, for, what, for what, what she's achieved, even to get to VP for next year um, in the US is, you know, we're, we are, we're only just uh, opening the can of, of worm stroke information of what she's dealt with to get where she has, bearing in mind who she is and where she's from. Um, so I I'm almost, almost could make her my, my woman of the year 2021, I think, as well, because that woman, as, as will obviously the new, but putting the politics aside, but that woman will be in a position to make some huge changes and, and huge repercussions. And I think she's one of the most incredible role models that we will have for the next number of years. So that is my woman of the year. Well, brilliant. Thank you so much for watching and for listening wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Uh, thank you for the people that are watching live. And if you're listening back to this, we hope you've enjoyed our festive show. Can I just, I just need to show you my, my best Christmas jumper. Um, and this is Nala's, look, look, Nala's got a new. <laughs> She looks great in her Christmas jumper. Um, so I wish to thank all of you for coming on. Francis Scott, thank you so much for joining us from West London. Thank you for coming. Fantastic to hear your story. Thank you so much for having me. I, it's really, it's been such a pleasure being here and such a pleasure to meet you, Joe, and uh, to be involved with your book and uh, such a pleasure to meet all, all of you here today. Thanks for your great questions. And thanks for all your your, 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 your personal question, Richard, you know, about how to sustain yourself, I think it's a really important one. Brilliant. And if you'd like to find out more about 5050, go to www.5050parliament.co.uk and uh, you can find more about 5050 and also social media at 5050 Parliament. Uh, Sarah Sabin, amazing coach, who hopefully we'll see again for sure on the Women Leading uh, two book and also the women leading show next year thank you for joining us thank you for having me and oh yeah <laughs> oh no great but thanks for coming on a uh, little last minute but really lovely to have you back uh joe sumner kim adele platz awesome co-hosts as always love you lots and uh look forward to seeing you next year for the women leading message hopefully a forum is what we're looking at an event in march so watch this space for that um, lovely to see you both. And Richard Bellas, you're awesome as always for being our, you know, women leading man. <laughs> There's a few of you in the book, but you, you champion us so well in our message and we're really super grateful. So my name is Joe Morgan Trot. Lovely to see you all. Have a very happy, hopefully peaceful and well festive season. And we will all look forward. Could we do a loud goodbye at the end just to deafen everyone and, and collective Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.